Hello, everybody. Hello. Is, is the sound on for everyone to hear now? Good. Anyone wave? Can hear me? Great. <laughs> Hi. Hello. It's, I'm in London and it's a lovely day here, I'm pleased to say. Hopefully it is with you. Pretty good. Um, not really here in Italy. Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. We'll just we'll just wait a few moments for people who are even further away from Italy to join us. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I don't have to move so much. No, I don't. Well, I see Ben is here and he's in Cornwall, I assume, are you? Yes, I am. That's okay. not quite far. So, very good. Uh, fellow, fellow compatriot here as well. Oh, uh, Colin. I'm Colin. You've made it. Yes, thank you. Yes. And, and Rose is up there in Scotland. Yes, I'm here too. I've, um, I'm joining oh. you this time. Well, cool. I, I can't unfortunately see everybody. Um, but maybe everybody's here now. Oh, there's more. I've just... Ah, someone's going already. Howard, where are you going? Well, it is uh, it too, and it's just gone a bit. So, um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Shreve from the Conservation Foundation, and uh, I'm going to be chairing this afternoon. And uh, Toby, uh, uh, Toby Meadows is uh, on the controls, and we're hoping that's going to work, rather than me have buttons and everything else to do. Toby is on the buttons and he's recording this session. So if you had a message, hopefully you're happy and you'll uh, agree to be recorded. Um, some people are not able to join us today. Uh, uh, Peter Bourne, for example, has gone down with a chest infection and laryngitis, but he assures me it's not COVID. So um, he's, he's not able to take part, but maybe um, Simon Edwards uh, in Brighton could say a few words when we come to that point about what's been going on in Brighton in, instead of Peter Bourne. Um, thank you. Mark Seddon uh, did get COVID and that, that stopped him from going to the States to see the elms over there. But anyway, Mark, I see you're with us now, so it's good well, to know you. David. I, I think I can see an elm growing up your curtain, though. Well, this is, yes. The last time I did uh, one of these workshops, I had I brought the elm in from the garden. <laughs> and, and I thought people might like to know that it's still, even though it looks a little bit autumnal, it's still growing strong. And uh, so we have a real elm with us just to um, make everybody happy. And, and hopefully it will grow on for, for many more round tables. Although one day it would be nice to all get together. And uh, hopefully we, we will uh, fairly soon, hopefully at, uh, at Kew sometime. Um, uh, uh, talking of Q. I mean, uh, most of the people taking part today were involved in Richard Bugs's application to NERC, and I'm sure we were all absolutely saddened when, uh, at the eleventh hour, we got a message from Richard to say uh, that it hadn't been successful. But onwards and upwards, and one of the things that Richard's proposal included was a sort of regular get together for elm experts and elm enthusiasts. So at least one bit of Richard's proposal is continuing, but I think there probably are more. So we're gonna start with Richard for him to update us uh, on his work at Kew. So Richard, would you like to take over? Well, thank you, David. I'm very grateful to you for organizing this round table as you have done roundtables in the past 
And um, I feel a bit of a fraud starting off this meeting because I know that many of you have been working on Elm a great deal longer than, than I have. Um, I guess I'm um, starting off because of the proposal that David um, mentioned, which was put to NERC in their call for um, grant proposals on treescapes. It was a very competitive call. Um, and unfortunately, the proposal wasn't funded. And I'm very grateful to many of you who were involved in that bid. For those who weren't involved, I, I'll just briefly summarise what its aims were. Um, we were trying to pull together various aspects of research on ELM in the UK. Um, and it had various components. It included social science as well as biological sciences. And we planned to map the current elmscape, elmscape of the UK, looking at relictual elms, um, including elms in hedgerows um, that were the remnants of past elms, so that we could really get an understanding of where elms were and also survey their genetic diversity to try to understand more about the genome-wide genetic diversity of the elmscape before Dutch elm disease. We also wanted to to put together a, a catalog of all of the plantations of elm that were being grown, including putatively resistant elms. Uh, we wanted to see if there was any signature of local adaptation in the genetics of the uh, relictual elm populations. We wanted to set up new trials of um, currently available resistant elm genotypes um, sourced from um, a mix of different sources including Italy and Spain, and it's great to see Alberto and Juan here representing um, those, those programmes. And we also wanted to uh, plant out trees from large elms that have survived in the UK, just in case some of that survival was due to, to real resistance and not, not other factors. And uh, we wanted to do some genomics, um, particularly looking at families that had been generated by Alberto and Juan and also by the late David Herding. Um, his resources were, are extremely good and very interesting, the, the crosses that he made, and we wanted to work on them. Um, I'm just looking at the, the list of um, what else we were planning. We wanted to have a, an app for phones that people could use to tell us where elms were. We were collaborating with some scientists in the USA um, on that. We wanted to set up the trials that I've mentioned. Um, and then we had another work program led by Mariella Mazzano at Forest Research um, to understand the priorities of tree managers and what they wanted from elms and whether they would be planting out elms if they're available and in, in what contexts. And a program on um, social science led by Rahema White at St Andrews, trying to understand how elms are valued and issues of intergenerational justice to do with uh, restoring lost species. And there were several collaborators in that. We were taking an economic perspective um, as well um, with various collaborators, many of whom are here on the call today. So it was a pity it wasn't funded. Um, and obviously one of the things we're thinking about, are there other sources of funding we could apply to? NERC has, is doing a second round of the treescapes, but this time the projects will be limited to two years in length um, and will be for much um, fewer resources. Um, but we might try with a subset of the proposal. Uh, we're having discussions with DEFRA and also there's the potential of private philanthropy but one thing I would want to stress is, you know, I, in no way should this proposal be seen as, as in any way exclusive. And there are many components of the project that um, could go forward in other contexts. And, you know, I personally would very much welcome any of the components going forward, even without my involvement. Um, just be, you know, for the sake of the elm, we need to to do some of these things. I would also say, although the genomics research will be very interesting, 
um, it, it's not going to be a silver bullet at this stage. And it would greatly benefit from there being more trials and more crosses and particularly the crosses done by David Hurling, if they could be expanded so we have more progeny from the same trees, that would help to build up the resources that really would enable the genomics to shed some light on what's going on. So just that word of caution about putting our faith in, in genomics. I think there's lots that can be done, but we really need trees in the ground um, and progeny being generated to make that um, optimal. I think that that's really all I have to say, David. Um, I'm happy to take questions or um, or not, as, as you see fit. Uh, well, thank you, Richard. One uh, question I've had from actually somebody else. Two questions, actually. Um, one is to say, what is NERC? And we should say it's the it's the Natural Environment Research Council. But the other was, uh, someone asked if Karen Russell would be taking part today, and uh, she isn't. And I know you've been talking to her. Do you have something to report on what, where she fits into this? Well, Karen and I wrote, wrote a report for the Future Trees Trust um, a year or two ago on where we're at with Elm. Uh, when I say I wrote it with her, I just contributed a few paragraphs on genomics. It was very much large, very much her work. Um, and it's a, a really good review of where we are in the UK on Elm. Um, it's available on the Future Trees Trust website. Um, and Karen is still, still very much keen to be involved. I chatted with her quite recently. And she is doing some work with DEFRA that I think Claire Trevetti will mention um, quite soon in her talk. Good. So any more questions for Richard before Claire comes on the stage? Well, we can pick it up perhaps in later uh, bits of this round table. So Claire, welcome. You're going to speak from DEFRA. Is, is that a drone ha hovering behind you in the picture or is, is it a <laughs> lampshade? <laughs> it's just a, yeah, a rather over the top ornate lampshade. <laughs> but yeah, and I must also apologise, my kitchen is being torn apart by builders as we speak. So I, I hope the background noise doesn't get too bad. Give me a shout if it does. And I'll, I have got headphones that might help a bit. Right. Listen, I think I gave you the wrong title, and it was an old title from your days at Kew. So just tell everybody what your correct title is at Defra. Yeah. yeah, so I'm, uh, I, I did work at Kew for, for many years at the Millennium Seed Bank. Um, but my role now is that I'm R&D manager in the plant health evidence and analysis team um, in Defra. So in that role, I oversee a portfolio of tree health research projects, and I'm also particularly working on our R&D strategy. Um, but it's worth you also being aware that I also work on the England Tree Planting Programme. Um, and there I work on a project which is helping to enhance planting material available for planting under the um, you know, government tree planting plans. So um, I kind of forgot this sitting in this place where fortuitously I can tell you about um, our research program and how that can feed into what you're doing on Elm, but also the more practical work we're doing to enhance supply of FRM. So um, if that's helpful, that's what I was going to do this afternoon. Yeah, that's fine. You you go ahead. Shall I launch in? So I mean, first of all, like like Richard, I feel um, very uh, you know humble in the sense that you the expertise in this room on Elm is um, you know huge, and I am very much here to listen and learn today and to understand more about what you're all doing. But I thought what I'd do is yeah, just give you a little bit of a big picture context. So you can see what's going on um, with DEFRA and how I can see some hooks of where you can take work on Elm forward. 
Um, so starting at the you know, widest scale, hopefully most of you have heard of and been aware of the England Tree Action Plan, which was um, published earlier this year. So the vision, the headline vision in there is to treble woodland creation rates by the end of this parliament to deliver planting of 30,000 hectares per year by 2025. Um, but beyond the numbers, the, the action plan talks about all the roles that trees play in delivering natural capital benefits, um, including woods managed for timber and other products, um, uh, but also societal and cultural benefits, uh, as well as biodiversity and ecological benefits. Um, and the action plan also notes that um, tree planting will, and funding will predominantly support the establishment of native broadleaves um, in England. It talks about planting woodlands that are more resilient to threats, including pests and diseases. So within that um, broad vision, I, you know, there's clearly supporting the future role of elm in the landscape clearly fits into that vision. Um, and it's also really clear to us that stakeholders are really keen to see elm included in, in new treescapes. So DEFRA is, is very supportive of work in that direction. Um, in terms of the tree health team, our work is specifically guided by the tree health resilience strategy, which um, was published back in 2018. So that strategy um, describes a, a resilience cycle which is focused on three outcomes. The first is resistance, which, which is around um, you know, reducing the risk of a threat, a tree health threat occurring. The second area is uh, response and recovery, which is around detecting and managing an outbreak. Now, clearly we're beyond both of those in terms of Dutch elm disease. But the third um, part of the cycle is adaptation. And the strategy there talks about activities to deliver long-term transformation to strengthen the landscape. It includes planting and managing treescapes to enhance resilience overall to pests and diseases, but it also talks about um, adapting to a disease, diseases which have already become established, such as Dutch elm disease, um, and it includes activities there such as targeted management of individual trees um, with naturally high resilience, understanding the basis for resistance, and managing and using that resistance um, in order to allow uh, the species to continue to flourish in the landscape. Um, so clearly, you know, that again plugs into to where your work sits. Um, and I think it's worth saying that of those three parts of the resilience cycle, it's that adaptation area where we have least experience. So from a tree health team point of view, we're not only keen to see our return to the landscape so it can continue to deliver all the benefits that it, it has, but we want to learn about the process of keeping trees that are really hit hard by um, disease in, in the landscape. So using this as a, you know, using elm as a case study, because we know we're gonna be in this place with other species, you know, in future years, unfortunately. Um, science is very much the foundation for the evidence-based approach that we take to problem solving. And so we're very keen to support science-based approaches, but obviously the objectives need to have um, impact on the ground. Um, so that's quite a long way of saying, essentially, we're here because we're really keen to, you know, support this work. Um, I've got some particular hooks that I can see into opportunities coming up um, in the near future that we could take work forward, potentially with government support whilst working with other routes and philanthropic funding and, and working with other donors as well. So the, um, as we've already heard, the NERC treescape's main call was unsuccessful, but there is this potential opportunity through the second call. And we are exploring with NERC whether we can um, 
leverage from that fund additional support. So NERC and CEFRA are working closely together to providing um, funding for research. Um, the other opportunities we have is that we have an ongoing uh, R&D programme called Future Proofing Plant House that brings together all the DEFRA arm's length bodies and we can put projects through that. Um, and the other exciting thing is that we're in the process of developing and launching a new centre for forest protection. And that's aimed at really providing science-based solutions to um, decision-making that you know, those planting trees into the landscape are going to be making over the coming years. So that, that centre will pull in expertise from uh, Q and forest research at its heart, but other organisations as well. So again, that's, that's an opportunity. Um, then through the Nature for Climate Fund, which is supporting the England tree planting programme, we've got a range of activities, as I said, to enhance uh, supply of forest reproductive material. Um, in particular, the Tree Production Innovation Fund, which was launched by SC this year, and we hope to see future rounds through that in the next um, couple of years. That's all aimed at enhancing not just quantity, but quality and diversity of um, tree planting material. So I think there's opportunities there as well. Um, and then as Richard hinted, I am working with Karen also. Um, so Karen is doing some technical work that we're doing in partnership with um, Forestry England, Forestry Commission and Woodland Trust looking at how we can develop species level strategies to enhance a supply of seed and other forest reproductive material. So those species level <coughs> strategies are being worked up right now and Karen has got witch elm on her list. So um, that's another bit of work that I'd really like to see looped in. Um, so I think that's probably most of what I wanted to say um, really you know just sort of really conscious that all of you here today have been working on Elm for far far longer than I have but it is I think a, you know really timely for us now to be sharing our experiences and collaborating to plan our future activities. Thank you thank you well that's uh, isn't it great to hear someone from government saying there's money available <laughs> uh, Claire, you've you've been a breath of fresh air, and uh, <laughs> any apart from people asking you for money, is there a question yeah. on from the floor that uh, someone would like to ask Claire? You'll have to wave your hands if we can. Is that? Oh no, that's someone putting on his headphones. Well, perhaps they don't have any questions, Claire. I, th I think I'd like to pop round and see you sometime and go through some of those details and see how you could really uh, help. Yeah, well, I'm sure, you know, beyond today, there'll be lots of live discussions for sure. Thank you. Very good. Well, now down to, to Devon, I think. And Sir Harry, are you in Devon or Somerset? I can't remember. I mean, I'm in Devon. Devon. I'm in Devon. Um, and I just, um, you know, I, I wanted just to raise the fact that I've been talking to um, actually to Richard, um, Richard Bugs, great, and, and Defra um, about the possibility of having a uh, another Elm conference next summer. And uh, I know that some people here were on the, uh, were at the conference in 20, I think it was 2016 at, at Lee's Court. Um, but I think there is a crying need to have a conference for a number of reasons. One, I think there is a plethora of other initiatives. I think the people on this call are far from a complete collection. Um, I think there's an important need for people to talk together in, a, in an environment that is, um, allows that to happen, but also I think to raise awareness and communicate externally about what is available and what is going on. Uh, and there are a number of things that we could do around that. Um, and not least, it would be helpful in supporting the science and, and raising the profile of, of what, people, um, what people are doing. 
Um, so in broad terms, we're looking at a conference in early July, in the first two weeks of July. Um, there are a number of questions that we are um, thinking about. Uh, I mean, not least of what Claire's more general point is the extent to which Elm is a trailblazer of what is going to become a wider issue um, with other species over the next um, 20 or 30 years, very possibly, and is already a, a major issue with, with ash. And the lack of focus, really, um, in the general world on adaption, rather than the idea of climate mitigation or trying to recreate what has created lived in the past. Um, as I said, we've, we've got, um, I've got good support, um, support um, from the ICF who are, uh, said that they will help us organize it. There's a number of charities that I'm talking to who may well help uh, fund it apart from DEFRA, although obviously we would charge uh, a bit for uh, attendance to recover our costs. Anyway, that's a, so that's the plan. I hope people are, are responsive to that as a, as a sensible idea to bring people together in, in, in July. Um, and I wasn't going to say um, really very much more, apart from the fact that I think uh, one aspect of Elm which doesn't seem to be discussed in these groups is the importance of Elm uh, as a farmer myself, as, a, as an agroforestry species, because agro forestry is coming up the agenda fast and it is one of the species with the most palatable um, palatable leaves and uh, generally its foliage is good for not least for goats but I mean it's a very useful um, addition in the middle in the current debates around future land use and so it is a very important area. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Yeah, who is the uh, leaves palatable to? Oh, goats. <laughs> oh. Goats for sure. But historically, historically, people, I mean, all the people who show goats in our the local county show will feed their goats on, on, on elm. But when, but historically, elm was a really important uh, species for winter fodder. But so, we're taking like hundreds of years, though. Yeah. Any more questions for... So your conference, presumably, it's going to be international. I would, I would jolly well hope so. I think we will do it on a on a, one of these um, these days hybrid systems. I mean, I'm very keen that you know it's not a it's not an it's not my conference. It's it's the, everybody who I can get involved at the conference's conference, um, and certainly it's international because I'm very conscious of a lot of work that's gone on in America. Uh, quite apart from, you know, uh, we've got, got uh, Juan and Alberto, but there are other, plenty of other people who have done a great deal of work. And I think the issue is about the introduction of species, the reintroduction of species, uh, is it's not straightforward. I mean, not only have we got the challenge of actually producing elms that are going to be satisfactory in the landscape, that is the process of introduction, how they fit in, you know, all the work that Andrew's done in, in um, Hampshire is very relevant, uh, but also introductions. I think Ron's been involved in some introductions and uh, also they've done stuff in America. And I think all of those, you know, are helpful to kind of bring together to look at the larger problem that we're dealing with. Right, thank you. Um, well, now, the, thank you. Those three first uh, presentations we wanted to get in and then uh, we've got a list of other people who want to say something and we couldn't have an Elm round table without something from Clive Razor and Joan Weber. Uh, they've been into Elms, well, one could say even longer than I have. So uh, when they called me yesterday and said, we don't think there's enough time for all the things you want to say, I sort of panicked and I thought, well, we've, they've got to take part somehow. Uh, Clive and Joan and indeed Andrew, who uh, were planning to do a presentation. So we've twisted an arm or two and we've said to Clive, or Clive volunteered actually, to uh, say something about his work and just bring us up to date. What I've said is we'll, we'll have a round table for them to take centre stage one day. But in the meantime, Clive, would you like to just bring us up to date with some of your work, please? Yeah, thank you, David. 
Um, and uh, I'd like to say hi to a few people out there, particularly Antonio, uh, Juan Antonio and uh, Alberto. Um, haven't seen you guys for quite some time, so good to see you, even on a very tiny bit of screen. Um, we were going to present some something of a, a PowerPoint. This is really myself, Joan, uh, and uh, Andrew. Uh, but uh, as, as uh, Dave has mentioned, we decided actually to cut that uh, just in case of time constraints. So what I'm going to do is just put some very general points across that uh, have occurred to us as something that's come out of a little bit of work that Andrew, John and I have been doing at some of his sites because his sites now are becoming an excellent laboratory for asking a few questions about what some of these new cultivars are going to be capable of doing. And we've just been doing some very, very preliminary work. These are really very much um, pilot studies on the back of a back of a, back of a fag packet, really. Uh, a few observations coming out of that. I'm going to start off just by diverting a little bit and say one of the things that's concerning me and then come back to the main issues. Um, I'm a bit concerned that some of our disciplines in the tree world are rather siloed at present. Um, and to just give an example of that, um, when I went to Spain 25 years ago to look at a, an oak dieback problem uh, that the Ministry of Agriculture asked me to go and investigate, I went out in the field with about 20 different people from different organizations and different disciplines. Uh, and we were all standing there looking at this oak dieback and the entomologists were telling me it was a buprested problem. The ecologists were saying it was drought. Uh, and the pathologists were saying it was a bit of a canker on the small twigs that was causing the issue. I looked at the topography of what was going on and said, please can I have a spade? I think this is a root problem. And after a couple of weeks work, we were able to show that the cause of this dieback, which is occurring generally on uh, cork oak and holm oak in Spain and Portugal, was due to a, the root, a root uh, pathogen Phytophthora cinnamomai, which is coming from Asia. It's a very, very dangerous pathogen. And it's been killing millions of cork oaks and uh, holm oaks across Spain and Portugal. But it really illustrates just how siloed people can be. And even then, I don't think there's full agreement um, across the Iberian Peninsula about the exact causes. And that disease is rather similar to that because, of course, we have tree specialists, beetle specialists, pathogen specialists. And quite often, I don't think there's enough cross support. And the sort of thing that Andrew, John, and I are looking at down at his sites down in South Hampshire really do illustrate that very well. Dutch yum disease isn't like chestnut blight or ash dieback, where the pathogen essentially goes from host to host with a resting phase in between. It's a much more complex system. It's got at least four different ecological phases. Resistance to disease occurs via a number of different processes in the feeding wounds, in the bark, in the xylem, and so on. There are lots of critical thresholds that influence the eventual outcome of disease, the actual disease levels. And so when we're talking about the disease in our cultivars and in our, in our populations, we really need to be considering, discussing, and also monitoring all these different phases at the same time. So come back to why am I saying this? Well, there are two main reasons. First, some of you may be aware we've got a bit of a developing almost lavish situation in Europe. Now, almost lavish has been put forward by a number of people as a species that's quite suitable, probably, for replacing some of our lost, almost meaner populations. Because it's been shown, it's shown to have had very, very good field resistance. And of course, it's been recommended for planting by people like Gordon working in Germany. But interestingly, in the last few years, we've seen a breakdown of this apparent field resistance in white elm, in European white elm, in almost levis. First of all, the Dutch reported that they were seeing unexpectedly lots of disease in almost levis in Zeeland. 
And in the last year or two, we've begun to see more and more infected almost lovis in the UK, particularly on a lot of the sites that Andrew's been looking at, but also up in Lincolnshire, for example, at the, uh, the Arboretum up there. So we know that something unusual is occurring with almost lovis. And what we really need to know now is why is it happening? We know the facts, but we don't understand the how or the why of this situation, which is somewhat unexpected. And there are an awful lot of possibilities. It could be climate change, gradual change. It could be for us looking at Andrew's sites, particularly the 2021 weather conditions. Could be a change in the pathogen, which I would suggest is probably unlikely. Could be a change in beetle vector behavior. For example, maybe scolitis scolitis, the larger unbarked beetle is beginning to return to some of our sites. And in fact, for the first time we've seen this year, we think that one of Andrew's sites will be looking at that uh, scolitis scolitis is coming back in much bigger numbers. So possibly this is part of the picture. It's also possible these trees are being overwhelmed by heavy vector feeding pressure due to heavy disease in the adjacent almost mina or almost prostor populations. In other words, there's been a surge in disease in almost mina, and then we're now seeing this spreading over into the European white elm, which is making it more susceptible. And if we add into that the possibility that the pathogen may be for the first time getting down to the roots, which it maybe wouldn't normally do, this is likely to result in death. Of, of these white elm trees. And all of these issues that we need to look at are really cross-discipline criteria. We need to research them, we need to monitor them, we're going to understand what is happening in white elm. And I think, as we've already heard, elm is a sort of pioneer system in some ways in terms of looking at adaptation. We're now beginning to see some more questions arising with elm that we're going, we're going to have to that's the answer. But we've really got a bit of a vacuum of information and we need data. And this is some sort of simple research data of various sorts, monitoring what is happening in these trees and trying to find the causes. Now, the second reason why I was venturing this whole issue, in addition to the white, the white elm aspect of it, is because of the large numbers of new cultivars of elm we're beginning to plant in the UK. And just in the same way as for white elm, where a lot of questions that we need to answer, I think we also need to understand just what disease pressures these cultivars were putting out there now in quite large numbers, although limited numbers of cultivars, quite large numbers. What disease pressures are these elms being exposed to? And I think if we can, we need to try and get some data. For example, how is resistance holding up in these trees or how will it hold up under our unique climatic conditions in addition to the climatic conditions they've been bred in? And I think for that, we're going to need some inoculation trials of some sort to see whether they might be more susceptible under UK conditions than, for example, in Italy or in Spain. How much are these trees being fed on by the beetles in the populations that we're releasing them into? Do they show resistance to the pathogen in, in the feeding wounds as, as well as in the xylem? Are xylem infections, infections occurring via the feeding wounds and not establishing or are they sometimes progressing a little bit further? Now, at the site that we've been working on in and with, with Andrew, one of his particular sites, what we've done is some packet of fab packet calculations, as I've already said, comparing some of the Adamuth cultivar um, feeding wounds, for example, with those on Ormus Levis. And we're beginning to get some data, but it's really too early to, to say anything particularly. Um, significant about that, but it's an example of the sort of thing that, that we're trying to look at doing. But I think just to summarize what I've said overall, I think we really do need to make sure 
we have a strong interdisciplinary approach to getting the information that we need on the performance of, of these elms in this current post epidemic situation, especially if some of these cultivars of interest like almost levis and the disease tolerant cultivars that have been produced in the Netherlands, Spain and in Italy that we're putting out there into the land, landscape. I think we also need to do it quite soon. First, because there's currently quite a disease resurgence going on in much of the landscape in Southern Britain. This is the ideal situation to get some sort of feeling for how these cultivars are going to perform. So I think the more cultivars we can put out in situations of high disease pressure, the, the quicker we're going to get the information. We need to get a handle on whether or not scolitis, scolitis begin, is beginning to spread back into the landscape because that will have an impact. Up till now, we've had mainly scolitis mitis striatus out there. We've not seen much scolitis scolitis, but scolitis scolitis, if it comes back into the picture, will have a lot more pressure on these elms. So we need more information on whether it's beginning to Sorry, I think uh, I think some people need to be muted. Uh, we're getting some cross lines, Clive. Sorry about that. Carry yeah, on. Okay. I'm, I'm almost done. And also, I think this is best done when the trees are small. In other words, when these cultivars we're putting out there are quite small, under five meters, because once they get over five meters, it's going to be very difficult to get information, for example, on how much they're being actually fed on in the landscape, and therefore how well their resistance is holding up. So I think in the next few years, it's really the time to try and, try, try and get this information. I do feel in a way that if we don't get this sort of data, then the sort of tolerant elm plantings we're putting out there would end up more like an awful lot of these modern urban tree plantings that we've got, where the trees are stuck in the ground, but then the authorities just walk away from them and, and hope for the best. I think we've got to make sure we try to accumulate some really good general information on how these, these elms are behaving. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Clive. Um, Andrew, would you like to add anything to what Clive's been saying? You've got a few mentions there. Uh, uh, can you hear me, Clary? Yes. Oh, we can't forgive. see you very well, but we can oh, hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try to do um, My only observation on that is how difficult the supply, cult the cultivar supply situation is post Brexit. Uh, Safo, the French Plant Breeders Association, have told us that none of the French nurseries are really interested in exporting to Britain any longer. Um, of course, there's the problem in, in, in Italy because of elm yellows and forcing elms there. So uh, the, 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 elms, the number of elms available now is, is severely restricted. Uh, we've got one small nursery in the UK, Frank Matthews, with plant breeders' rights to propagate lutes. But again, uh, they're a small fruit tree specialist and they're not really able to uh, propagate more than about seven or 800 trees a year. So there's, there's a critical supply problem here. Right. Thank you. Brian, uh, Andrew, you also asked me about Brian Eversham and uh, his work. Uh, Brian's at the AGM for the Wildlife Trust today. I just wonder if you want to mention that research on the DNA profiling uh, uh, that people might be aware of or may not be aware of. Yeah, um, as, far, as far as I understand it, he's working in association um, with the John Innes Trust in Norwich and uh, Cicely Marshall at Cambridge on DNA profiling the, the, the British elms. Um, which, according to uh, Sal and Murrell, now number 62 species or micro species. Right. Thank you. Just before uh, I ask for questions, uh, Joan, you were sitting up there, not in your usual pink outfit. You've left me to wear the pink today. 
So uh, do you have anything to add to what uh, Clive was saying? Not particularly. It's a very pale pink, uh, as a matter of fact, David, today. So I'm glad you're carrying the flag. Thank you. Uh, but but I, I do think if we're to have a future plenty out some of these uh, resistant or more resilient elves, it is essential that we're able to propagate them in nurseries in this country. So it's no good creating a market for them if the market can't be supplied by a marketplace. Right. Noted. Okay, well now, do, do, what about any questions for Clive and, and his research there? Anyone out of you? Uh, yes, I wonder if I could... Um, yes? Um, I'm interested, uh, Clive, that you said uh, uh, there appears to be a breakdown in resistance of almost leaves. Um, I've got a number of Davies Elm um, near, near me, and over the last few years I've noticed that they're being attacked by something which looks like elm disease in the first stages, but it doesn't progress down the tree. Uh, if I can share my screen, I can show you uh, some images. Um, I took these this morning. Can you see those? Yes. Yeah. Um, the, the, there's a mature tree and, and this younger tree on, on the right um, shows it quite quite well. Um, it, 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 the, the, the tree seems to die back and then you get a, a, a plethora of these young uh, shoots and by the end of the summer it's recovered but uh, it, they're having repeated attacks and certainly the younger tree appear to be um, more affected than the, the, the bigger trees um, but I, I wonder is, is this what you're seeing uh, with Levis? Um, Colin I would say Almost certainly not, actually. What, what we're seeing with Lewis is fairly classic Dutch elm disease symptoms. Um, and looking at those pictures, this uh, bottle brush effect at the end of those shoots, is, is there actually any death of tissue there that you see? Uh, yes, the, 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 the shoots do die back, but, but the whole branch doesn't die back like, like it would in classic elm disease. No. I mean, that looks to me a fairly novel symptom, symptomatology there, actually. Something I've, I can't recall having seen anything quite like it before, and I'm sort of reminded of which is broom. Type That's what it looks like, yes. Infections that are caused by by a my, things like mycoplasmas and prion type things. Um, and I'd be slightly worried actually looking at it as to whether it might or might not be something we've not seen before. Right. So um, inv investigation, I right. think any, any Joan, advice Joan, on... might, Joan might want to comment on that. Yeah. Well, I was only going to say with the Lavis, uh, we, we've isolated off the Austin Overwhelmy from the infected tissue, so we're pretty confident it is Dutch elm disease. And uh, I, I think this might be one that you want to flag up, for example, with tree alert, um, with the pictures, and maybe even send in some samples, and they can have a look to see if they can provide any more information. Right. Okay. Will do. Thank you. Colin, did you say these are some of David Hurling's trees? Uh, they're they're uh, Davies Elm. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, named, named by um, oh, uh, Jane, Jane Armstrong back in the uh, late 80s. Right. Okay. From uh, Glasgow University. She did quite a lot of work on genetic profiling. Uh, at Glasgow Uni University, but unfortunately, I don't think her papers were ever published. Right. And whereabouts are they? Uh, these are in, in Cornwall, just outside Newquay. Uh, okay. the, the, the biggest tree we've got, uh, there's a three or four that are over five metres girth, so they're pretty substantial trees. 
Right. Do you have a copy of that paper that she didn't write, as, as it were? You, uh, I've, I've got an early draft, yes. Be interesting to see it. Right. Yeah. 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 Can do that. Right. Shall, I, shall I send that via you, David? That yes, by all means. Yeah. yeah. Good. We're, we're getting closer to tea time, but John Stokes, you're, you've got your hand up there. So is it, is it about that subject or yes, is it raising something else? Hi, David. No, no, it's about that subject. Um, hi, Clive. Um, we had quite a lot of reports this year from tree wardens around the country. Can somebody give me screen sharing access, please, as well? Um, we had quite a lot of in, um, feedback this year from tree wardens who had disease resistant elms, Clive. Can you see that as it come on the screen? Yeah, yes, it's there. Um, the symptoms of which look like this. Now we've sent this to Anna um, Perez at, at, at Forest Research. But have you come across anything like this on any of your, on, on notionally disease resistant stuff? Depending what it is, to me, it looks a bit like a tarry spot type of disease, which is an ascomycete, I think, that we yeah. saw sometime back in the 1980s or so, um, that, we, that we actually hadn't seen much before. Um, and we've seen sporadically since then, but, but uh, without actually knowing exactly what the organism is, I wouldn't like to be sure. We have so seen, you know, it's a bit like, it looks a little bit like the sort of tar spot you get on sycamore leaves. It does. Which, yeah, which is nice and we, we, and, yeah. we have sent specimens to Anna, but it was just noticeable this year that we had reports from tree wardens from all over the, the place that their that their disease resistant elms were showing were showing that similar symptom across a number of them. So just that sense of an early warning system, something's going on out there that we didn't know what it was. So we will we will keep you all in touch. And the, the other question I had was that Andrew said, Andrew said about species and micro species of elm. So I just wondered in that, in the elm world where, where, where we have got to in terms of species and micro species, what, what are we describing as, as elms? Is it field elm and which elm are there? How are we, what language are we using? Well, you've got some elm specialists in Spain and Italy here as well to, to comment on that. And I, I personally, just my own point of view, I don't subscribe at all to these microspecies. Um, from the limited molecular data I've seen, particularly from uh, RBG in Edinburgh, um, almost MENA, which has been split up to, into, into an awful lot of microspecies, I think, in the latest, that latest taxonomy, really is a fairly cohesive, if very diverse, eco, and ecotypically diverse species. Um, but of course, there are a lot of hybrids which really confuse the picture. So certainly what we, we work with at Forest Research is basically field elm, witch elm, white elm. Um, and field elm, we, we sometimes will split English elm off from that, although really I think uh, the Madrid group would see that as a form of almost MENA, the Atinian elm, uh, but we're still in the habit of calling it almost prosser up to a point ourselves. But uh, you know, Juan and uh, Juan and Alberto might have something quite useful to say about about this. But certainly, we just stick with the three, the three main taxa, and and, and accept there are an awful lot of ecotypes within almost MENA in particular, right across Europe. Good. Okay, John. Is it still Tree Week, or is, have you finished Tree uh, Week? No, it starts on Saturday coming, David. Um, Sorry, so I myself. Well, good, luck. Uh, yeah, good luck with that. Any highlights you'd like to tell people about? Well, there's lots of activity going on around the country. Um, there's been a big upswing in, in interest in Elm this year, uh, and people have been putting in a lot of requests for planting grants from a whole range of places. So this element of what are we doing in the landscape, what are we planting, and what, what is suitable is, is very foremost because of ash dieback. And so Elm 
has become much more popular, but as, as Andrew has said, the supply hasn't been there in the nursery chains for delivery. So we've had lots of people saying, where can we get elms? What, what elms should we be planting? What's the possibility? So um, it'll be, as it always is, that one of the interesting questions though this year is for the first time in the 30 years I've been doing it, uh, the nurseries are not quite ready and climate change is meaning the season's being pushed back a bit. So we are going to have to look at the timing of tree week in future because, you know, it's not now suitable, necessarily suitable for for um, for bare, bare root planting. So lots and lots of issues, but it'll be good as always. So thank you, David. Ah, I was going to ask Gordon, how are things over there in Germany? Ah, quite well, actually. <laughs> to see you. First of all, thank you very much for having me. I enjoy it very much. And um, well, given the circumstances, um, the situation is not too bad. Um, we had a large planting scheme uh, last year, putting some 700 elms into the ground. And um, we are headed for a genetic project. Um, to to really give us an insight into the variability of particularly field arm because we we observe different strains clones however you might call them and we want to shed some light into this matter with the overall aim of course to reproduce elm in the uh, flat plain forest Good. I, have, I, have, I have one remark, if you don't mind, for Clive. Yes, Clive, present? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I, I can't see him. Sorry, Clive. Um, yes, we know that um, white elm has a field resistance, which is um, which might be located somewhere in the bark, whether it's um, it's some some uh, biochemical stuff or whatever. Uh, we should not forget that we also have evidence of trees overcoming the disease. And I think that should be kept in mind that um, uh, Dutch elm disease is not a one-way street to death, but elms can overcome the disease. And particularly, we have evidence that uh, white elm is doing that. Right. Aline. Ah, no, she's just reaching for her headphones. Very good. It's, it's uh, Robert, I see you're there, and I know that you were down to do a sort of brief presentation, but then you contacted to say you wouldn't do it. But I just thought, um, whilst we're having our tea, you'd like to give your your book a plug. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank How's you. How's it doing? Uh, oh, it's selling well. Um, people who don't know it called barn club uh, published by chelsea green um, and it's about the making and raising of a traditional hertfordshire barn uh, made of elm which is the traditional material here um, using hand tools and volunteers so did it all by hand and raised raised it in a weekend by hand as well so, um, and in the way of a traditional rural craft of course people used to know an awful lot about their materials and got them locally. So there's um, a good few chapters about elm trees and, and in fact, elm timber as well. So, uh, which um, certainly the idea behind that was to put the, the um, for people who aren't familiar with living elm trees, large living elm trees in the landscape, um, an introduction to, to those, those trees that are still out there. Yeah, and you see a, a great future for elm in the building industry. <laughs> well, I, I certainly in the timber framing, um, and uh, for people who who want to use their local materials, then uh, elm is a elm is an option. Um, certainly in small scale, there's a small scale supply. If you go straight to the landowners, no point going to a sawmills and asking for it. But if you go to the landowner, they they often have one or two. So uh, yes, it's to encourage people not to sell them, but to use any 
any any timber that you can frame with um, to to think about that because of course the framing is done green so you don't have to wait for it to season or any so that sort of complication it can just be uh, milled and and uh, you can set to straight away with hammers and chisels and everything else so it's um it's a lovely wood to work with absolutely amazing um and a superior to oak in many ways because of the the cross grain means that the um the more centenon joints are less likely to burst out under under strain so uh, i think they realized that in the 18th century certainly around here switch to switch to elm as their favored framing material your, your book is a great example of a community enterprise as well isn't it you know you really got everybody involved and in, to build this barn yes um uh, and uh Everyone had a lot of fun. They weren't necessarily carpenters. As a, a strange thing, but timber framing carpentry, as opposed to joinery or cabinet making, is really accessible to complete beginners. Um, it's a very simple kind of process. Whilst you, when you've got your head around the laying out and using plumb bobs and scribes, um, so people of all ages and um, men and women with little or no experience, none at all in some cases, um, had a lot of fun and. Just over, it takes a bit longer to do it as opposed to machines, but if you've got volunteers, then of course it doesn't cost anything. So it was a commercially viable project run as a part of my business. Um, and uh, the owners absolutely loved it. So, uh, as, as indeed a lot of people in the village still uh, talk about it, uh, with great fondness, yeah. yeah. Well, it's an idea for Richard at Kew Gardens. Invite the community in to build an elm <laughs> barn. That would be a great bit of promotion for you. Oh. Add that to your next application. Why not? <laughs> yeah. So, right, let's... Um, is, uh, who did I say? Oh, Simon Edwards. Simon, are you there to talk about Brighton and its elms briefly? Y yes, I, I certainly can. And... Um, Thank you, first of all, for inviting me along today. I'm uh, uh, really humbled to be in this, this presence. I'm not an elm expert. I ought to say, tell people immediately. Um, just to say that um, uh, I'm in Brighton. Well, I'm pretending to be, thanks to the miracle of Zoom. And of course, uh, Brighton, you all, you all know the relevance of elms and, and Brighton. But I think to the huge amount of the public, uh, the fact that Brian's the National Elm Collection or what even the National Elm Collection means is a complete mystery. Mention Brighton and they'll talk about the pavilion or perhaps the pier or pride, but um, elms won't feature, um, despite them being on sort of every street and it being the National Elm Collection. Um, so the public just don't know about um, the National Elm Collection and about elms in general, I think. And... Um, uh, I've been doing a bit of work with, um, well, actually not um, uh, with two people, um, Peter Bourne, who obviously is an absolute elm expert and a Brighton local, and he's Vivian. Elm tree, I think, isn't he? Yeah, well, yes. I mean, yeah, and um, uh, to be mentioned at, at the beginning with him uh, is ex is extraordinary, you know. Um, but we've done a little bit of work with uh, him and uh, Vivian Barton, who is just a, a local. Um, um, uh, a local interested Brighton person um, to map some of the National Elm Collection, some of the uh, loveliest um, uh, trees, some of the most unusual trees, um, and present them in a way with a web, uh, a web map, um, app, and um, uh, paper uh, um, uh, map. Um, so that the public can sort of find them and explore them and find out um, and get excited about them. People go on safaris um, <laughs> abroad or used to um, to see animals. Why not go and explore and get excited about elms in Brighton was the idea. And it's just it seemed to me amazing that um, uh, Vivian and uh, Peter and just myself, so sort of basically three ordinary people have mapped something that um, for some reason no bigger organisation had done, and uh, including the council, um, in a way to make it accessible to the public. 
and I'm very hope, very much hoping next year we'll be launching this at the um, Urban Tree Festival. Um, and um, I very much hope that um, uh, the public will enjoy it and will use it. They'll find the map, they'll find the trees um, and learn about some of the amazing stuff that you're doing and how great trees, uh, the elm trees are there. I have got some, just had some pictures, but I don't know whether on an iPad I can, could I share my screen on an iPad? I've never, never actually tried to do that. But um, I'd just like to show you a... Uh, well, Toby's our, our a, expert. I'm not I'm, sure, Toby. Uh, I don't know. Can I do it? Can I do that? I don't know. Here we go. Oh, God. Recents. You don't want recents. Am I? Here we are. Uh, let's go to me. Can, are you seeing my album now? You're seeing my whole album, aren't you? No, I think, um, no. I don't. Uh, let's just have a look at. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly get you up the picture of Peter. I hope. Done. Are you seeing that? Oh yeah. yeah. There we are, Peter and Vivian, and I think that's an almost uh, glabra macrophilia, a uh, macrophylla behind mm. um, from memory, um, but uh, just a, a wonderful Brighton tree. And um, let's have another look, see if I can get another picture um, of the map that we're, we're producing. Uh, 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 how do I go back to that? Can't do it quickly. Don't want to delay you all. <laughs> so there's a map for Brighton's elms. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Simon. That, that, that's great. I'm trying to think what the twins the Elm Twins in the park at Brighton are called. But Preston, was, Preston, 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 Preston yeah, Twins. Yeah. Yeah. One, of course, it's now one, but the other one's being preserved. And I think the um, I think there is fear that the, the second one has some. Uh, they're, they're observing for with um, Dutch Elm now as well. Unfortunately. Well, I think the one that hold on, Mark. I just think the one that was lost is being filled with gold, or at least the. Uh, the markings that remain are being filled with gold, so it becomes a, a real memorial to uh, the yes. elms that have been lost. Mark, you've yes. been down looking at the elms of Brighton, haven't you? Yeah, no, no, I was in, very interested, and nice to meet you, Simon. I, I, Hi, I mean, nice it's, to meet you. It's rather, rather disturbing to hear that the other Preston Park tree might be affected. Now, I, I was down there twice this year, and I, I had reported a but of course, the, the council already knew about it, but an elm not very far away uh, from the mm. Preston Park twin that had been um, hit by uh, elm disease. And it does strike me going back. I mean, for what it's worth, I first got interested in the elm because my grandmother lived in Hove and there was one uh, grown yeah. outside her front door. <laughs> and, um, and there was a sapling next to it, another young elm, which we watered during the great drought. So, but, the, but going down, I've, in recent years, I've noticed that the, the more and more All right, how are you? Good. more and more of the larger realms are being um, affected and I'm just wondering why you think there might be possibly more disease around and also what do you think about the response of the council is it as good as it has ever been in terms of and, and also Eastbourne of course as well which is a still a redoubt of the elm I think but how are the local councils and has funding for the own programs in, in Brighton and Eastbourne? I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer these questions for, for Brighton Council and the management at all, I'm afraid. Um, I, can, uh, I can certainly, uh, um, uh, with, the, um, with the publication of this map, we'll certainly be giving more information about current management, I know. Yeah. Is, but is, is, the, is the disease a bit more prevalent at the moment in Brighton? Would there does say? seem to have been there does seem to have been more trees affected by it recently, um, certainly over the last year or so. Yeah. Right. Well, let's um, let's change completely by going to Scotland now and and uh, uh, witch elms. Now, Rose, are you going to report or Alain or? Yes, Rose? I'm happy to say something about this. Lovely. Um, thanks very much, David. I, I haven't uh, participated before in this group, and it's, a, it's an honour. Um, I am I'm not an expert. I am a th an enthusiast, um, and I work 
um, with the Botanic Gardens on, uh, as an associate. Um, I'm working with um, Max Coleman, who you know, I think all of you, um, is unfortunately not able to be with us today. But um, yeah, uh, I would just like to say a few things. Um, I've been in touch with a number of you about this very small project we're doing at the moment, um, looking at um, potential as a scoping study, looking at the potential for which elm, um, uh, potential for developing a project in Witch Elm with the Botanic Gardens. Um, this will be a, um, a project hopefully in the coming years, but yeah, we felt that uh, we needed some more information about the situation uh, with, with the Elm at the moment and whether this was feasible. As I say, it's a, it, it's a small study, it's just been taken over the summer, which I've basically been working on. Um, we want to uh, see really uh, looking at mature field elm, uh, for mature witch elm in, um, across um, the central area of Scotland um, at the mature trees to see if we can uh, locate these some more of these trees and propagate them. And um, we're very aware that this has been done quite a number of times, but uh, we felt that uh, to get anywhere with this, we're going to have to be a bit more selective, both find the elm and propagate them, um, but select them um, as well. And to do this, it's going to be quite challenging because of the, uh, the state of which elm at the moment in, um, because of the disease. So um, we, uh, we're looking at the potential of working with a few small number of groups across the area um, to collect information, to find these trees and to select the best individuals to propagate them. So they would be propagated and produce a small number of collections, maybe only one, but certainly a small number of uh, collections um, in across the country to um, for future research on uh, potential field resistance. Um, I know that I'm very grateful for those of you who have contributed and sent me information because I have been in touch with quite a number of you because I, I appreciate there's such a wealth of information out there and and this has been done at, at, well both at the Botanic Garden but also in places around the country. Um, so um, really this information is just going to feed into um, what I'm producing so that we have this uh, background of, um, of to draw on if we can develop a project on this. The, the challenge really we see, that I see really is that um, finding these individuals is going to be very difficult. And um, so the, one of the best ways we felt we could do this is to find the groups that could um, draw on their extended network of members to uh, to locate potential trees and then they would be involved in the process with the specialists in selecting and uh, propagating them probably at botanic gardens um, then those trees that do grow up would go back into the small collections in the local area. So as I say, we're not expecting to get a larger number of trees once they've been selected down to get the best individuals. But um, the, the main thing I've been looking at has been the best groups we could involve in that, the people who have the resources to, to find trees and um, also the propagation side of it as well, because there's been quite a lot of uh, witch elm propagation, but uh, there are challenges, especially in uh, propagating older mature trees and then getting them back to a site where we can 
uh, propagate them and grow them up. So um, I've been trying to contact as many people as I can that with um, expertise on this, experience of this, just to get a better idea of, of um, the difficulties involved in that and what, what would be the best approach for us to, um, to go with in doing that. Well, thank you, Rose. It's obviously an ongoing project that we will hear about from, you know, again. Uh, Aline, do you want to add to what Rose has been saying? Um, no, it summarized it really well. I mean, obviously, the, the idea is to you know, use these uh, trees for work and um, Really interested uh, whether it's feasible to actually go ahead with this project and maybe just to quickly introduce myself as well. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm a conservation <laughs> conservation geneticist, so I'm not really an elm specialist, but so my my involvement would more be from the yeah co conservation uh, genetics side of things. Like, do these resistant trees show any differences in their genetic diversity um, compared to um, well? Well, anyway, so maybe looking at that as well at the genetic side, but um, mainly at the practical conservation aspect. Good. Well, thank you for joining us, and uh, mm -hmm. and good luck with with the witch elms in your part of the world. Um, so let's pop over to Spain. That's rather a nice little introduction. Juan Antonio, uh, tell us what you've been doing. Hello uh, from Spain. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, nice uh, meeting. And I'm uh, very happy to see some colleagues, uh, Clive, Joan, uh, Richard, uh, Alberto, Andrew, and, and so on. So uh, very nice to be here. Well, uh, I just uh, want to summarize uh, some of the last progresses that we have made in Spain with uh, our um, reading program. Uh, I think I can, I have a small presentation, so I, I will share my, my screen. Um, uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, just a small background. Probably uh, many of you already know that uh, in 2014, we uh, selected seven Ulmus minor cultivars, uh, tolerant or resistant to Dutch and disease, that were registered in as resistant material. Uh, however, we uh, later discovered that uh, two of them were uh, some uh, Ulmus humila genes in, in his genome. So um, we started to use this, uh, these clones in restoration activities, but uh, uh, in the last three years, we, we discarded these two uh, introgressive uh, clones. We have started our reintroduction actions with these five uh, name clones with the Life Elm project um, in which we have planted around uh, 9,600 plants of these five native resistant genotypes together with uh, more than 7,000 Ulmus levies in here close to Madrid in the central Spain. And in other activities, in other uh, restoration activities outside the Life uh, project, we have planted more than uh, 40,000 trees throughout Spain in different uh, parts of Spain. And some trees also have been provided to, uh, to the UK and have been planted there. Uh, by the moment, uh, no severe uh, symptoms of Dutch and disease have been detected in such plantations. However, uh, this year we have detected uh, slight symptoms in one retiro and one death at the La Villa trees, 
in Salamanca, Central Spain. Uh, we, we ca you can see in this photo the symptoms of that cell disease, they are very clear. Uh, but uh, the trees uh, recovered quite, quite well. The disease didn't progress very much. So uh, we concluded that uh, probably these two clones, Metilo and Desa de la Villa, are the less resistant among these five uh, Spanish cultivars. Ademuth, Majadahonda, and Desa de Maniel uh, remain without uh, symptoms. Uh, we hope uh, this can continue in the future. Concerning breeding activities, um, two new native uh, genotypes uh, behave as resistant in inoculation trials and are now in process of registration. And we have made uh, control crosses between uh, these native resistant varieties. Um, here you can see in this plot, uh, we had more than 1,000 seedlings coming from these uh, progenies. Some of them, this plot has been inoculated and showing promising resistant levels. Some, some of these trees uh, showed very high resistant levels, and many of them uh, show no symptoms at all after two inoculations with the pathogen. So uh, in the next year, we are now replicating these seedlings to test these uh, new varieties with enough clonal replication. We are uh, using in vitro techniques for propagating and also to detect, to try to develop an early uh, uh, screening method, at least to discard very susceptible trees and try to avoid high plantation uh, areas. We have also conducted in the last uh, three years, uh, new field surveys. Uh, and we have selected about uh, 600 adult trees of potential interest, in which we have uh, analyzed um, chloroplast and nuclear markers to discard ulmus procera, ulmus procera individuals, clonal trees, or uh, ulmus pumila. And interestingly, uh, we found that uh, around 20% of these trees were cloned individuals of Ulmus Prothera, English elm, which is still quite uh, present in, in Spain. Is uh, um, still uh, there are many su surviving uh, trees. Among these uh, trees, we have selected around uh, ten new uh, genotypes, which are being now in vitro propagated to be planted in experimental plots, and in the future, in the next uh, years, we, we will be inoculated uh, with a pathogen, yeah. but we have to wait uh, uh, at least uh, three or four years. And uh, we still uh, are going on with uh, conservation activities. We conserve about 700 genotypes in several ex situ collections. And we have also updating the natural population of white elm in, in Spain, which is uh, they are usually very small and relic population, but uh, we are now we have no more knowledge about this uh, species in in our country. And uh, in the future, we hope to to advance in molecular studies on elm resistant. Uh, we hope uh, to collaborate probably with Richard or uh, I don't know, but uh, we have also applied for a new project on on this subject. Uh, we hope uh, to continue with the screening uh, the resistance of new clones, evaluate the behavior of the planted trees, and also we, we wish to characterize uh, pathogen isolates and probably to conduct some studies on virulence of uh, this uh, new, probably emerging uh, uh, strains of, of the isolate. And that's all for my part. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, we cannot hear you. There was me. I've actually got a sign to tell people that you're on mute, and I needed it for myself. Uh, it's it's there if you ever need it. Um, so that was great. 
Uh, fantastic. And when you said that's all, I was saying that's, that's a great presentation and really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I, was, I think whilst we've got a touch of the sun, we should stay in a warm clime and, and go over to Italy, where Alberto is was saying it was a lovely day there when uh, we jo he joined us. Is it still lovely? Thank you, David. No, it was a misunderstanding. Today is the, the first cold day oh, no. uh, of the year, so it's raining and it's cold. But we had a fantastic weather until yesterday. Oh, fantastic. Warm weather, and it was nice. <clears throat> do you want me to say something? Absolutely. Do, do the floor is yours, as we say. Thank you, David, and thank you, uh, especially for having invited me to this uh, round table. And I had the, the chance to, to see many old friends that I can't see for long. Uh, unfortunately, I, I have to say that we didn't progress so much in the last years on ELM research, except for two, um, uh, uh, we followed two pathways. One was uh, uh, trying to understand whether it is possible to have a biological control of, um, of a pathogen uh, through um, another fungus that seems that it is uh, interested to, to, to feed on uh, um, Ophiostoma novoulmi. And uh, we are following and looking for uh, having clearer ideas on this. And on the other hand, we are working on conservation of species and we um, found um, European white island populations that was not considered uh, indigenous, but we, we found that they were. Uh, here in, in Italy, and we had the chance of um, uh, starting by the um, chloroplast analysis, the entire chloroplast. I can, uh, ju just for, for specialists, I know, but just to, to show this, that is the the map of chloroplast genome that we of uh, almost levis that we uh, obtained <clears throat> and uh, this uh, ju just to to tell you that uh, uh, we are still working on on, uh, on l but uh, at uh, at, a, at a reduced speed unfortunately because we have lack of uh, funds on this research, but we, we try to, to keep it alive. And we still have some plans in our nurseries. We still follow in some way what we planted in, in the years <clears throat> and they are still alive. So our uh, resistant clones are still alive and uh, still uh, resistant. That's all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alberto. That's uh, interesting for us to hear these stories from far away. Uh, we've got Mark Lane next, who's actually much nearer home. Um, Mark has uh, an amazing job of looking after the Queen's Garden at Buckingham Palace. So uh, we've got a right royal guest now to tell us about a new project of elm planting right here in the centre of London. Mark, tell us about Elms for London. Wonderful. Th thank you very much, David, and thank you very much for inviting me along. It's been a, an absolutely fascinating animal. But I, I have uh, been invited to come along and tell you about a new project that we've started recently in London. Uh, it's called Elms for London, as David has said, and it's run under the umbrella of the Metropolitan Public Gardens Association, which is a charity with a long history of conserving landscapes in London. We all know 
that a lot of work has been done by other organizations recently uh, for planting just young disease resistant uh, trees. So we felt the MPGA should uh, add extra impetus to this. Our preliminary work involved gauging the extent of the current elm population in London. And with the help of a spreadsheet provided by the tree register of the British Isles and the Mayor of London's tree map, we began work to look at what was out there and what was still alive. It's only when arriving at the site of a tree, often finding a pile of wood chippings or a stand of newly planted other species, did we realise how few are extinct. Our organisation has created partnerships with commercial nurseries, a community nursery in Hackney who are helping to grow on young trees for future years. And we now started looking for uh, potential recipients. We've created networks across the board in order to uh, help this situation, but also uh, listening to uh, the, the experts and the speakers today, I know there'll be a lot more emails moving around after that. We do have uh, a, a number of uh, limits and constraints, of course, uh, none less financial and the need for us to gain more sponsorships. So really just to conclude what I'm, I'm sort of aiming for is if anyone knows someone who would like an elm tree, uh, be it a, a park or a private garden, then please let me know. Uh, the, if anyone can also suggest funding opportunities, then please uh, do let me know that as well. And I'm pleased to report that we have a website with the ubiquitous social media feeds that make the whole project quite dynamic. And if I can just take the time to give you all the address, it's www.elmsforlondon.org.uk. And I'd be very happy to hear from anyone who can help us with this uh, spread of London, of, of Elms across London again. So thank you. And I'll hand back to David. Thank you, Mark, and uh, give our best wishes to Her Majesty when you see her. And um, uh, we, we look forward to Elms for London. That's uh, the number four, if you're looking it up on the website. It's Elms letter number four, London. And uh, we hope it will, these Elms will be part of the Queen's green canopy, which is going to be planted all over the country to celebrate uh, long life which continues, of course. Um, now, uh, Howard Gregory, uh, are you there? I can't see everybody. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, oh yeah, there you are. You're great. Well, take us, tell us about, because yours is another local project, isn't it, really? Yeah, so, um, so I've done a, 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 um, a case study into a local project um, my name's Howard, Howard Gregory from Epsom. Um, so I got in touch with the local um, Epsom Common. I'm obliged to say that Epsom Common is owned by Epsom and Yorbao Council. So every time I say Epsom Council, I mean, sorry, every time I mean, uh, every time I say Epsom Common, I mean Epsom and Yorbao Council. Anyway, um, so the uh, I was interested in introducing Elm into the local landscape to enhance the historical landscape and to bolster the fragile populations of hair shrink butterflies. Um, so I made a case, a, a study of Epsom Common, which has got quite a good uh, result on different aspects. Um, so Epsom Common is, is managed by Epsom Rural Council and other associations are involved, like National England and uh, biodiversity groups. Um, and Epsom, uh, Epsom Commons, Epsom Common, is uh, run by a, a group called the Epsom Common Association, um, which is about, uh, it's about 438 acres and borders on to Ashstead Common, which is managed by the City of London, which is about 200 acres. Um, it's adjacent to Crown Forestry Land and other woodland, uh, and Epsom Common is of national and international importance due to the veteran pollarded oak trees with dead and living crowns. Uh, the dead wood in the oak trees support a very diverse biodiversity, which has resulted 
in SSSI status. Um, so the Epsom Common Association are focused on increasing biodiversity of the common, and they're delighted that um, they've recently identified all five species of the hair streak butterfly on the common. Uh, the latest discovery is the black hair streak butterfly. These elm dependent butterflies have been found despite the common having few elm trees. The Epsom Common is aware that because the, uh, uh, the um, hair streak butterflies are slow to migrate, the existing populations must be nurtured by adding elm species which they feed on. Uh, the Epsom Common would like to introduce the bite would like to increase the biodiversity of the common and surrounds by planting Dutch elm disease resistant trees. The uh, common has nurtured the common very sensitively, leading to the SSI status, um, and are looking to make it into like a hub of um, into allowing other species to migrate and migrate out. Um, The, um, they would like to get involved with planting more elm trees um, and also, but not just elm trees, if there was uh, planting projects involving a belt of land, then they'd like to uh, work with other groups who are concerned about other types of trees, for example, um, Sorbus torminalis or more um, uh, uh, other trees that are not uh, that are also missing from the English countryside. Um, they have um, various sites that they could would like to plant more trees on, um, and uh, but it's all down to uh, funding. And I'm also on the uh, Epsom um, Tree Council, um, and there's a real problem with uh, they've got money for trees. They've got money. They've got volunteers to plant the trees but they can't get the council to okay the sites uh, because they're just uh, inundated with work. Uh, but they have the ECAR working on, they've got uh, about 70 sites that they have identified that trees could be planted on. Um, part of my research, part of my research um, going back to John Stokes about the availability of plants, I spoke to um, Hilliers about their um, their trees that they, the Dutch elm disease resistant trees that they do. Um, and I inquired about the large trees and they said, you, you, you can apply. They do typically uh, 10 to 12 centimeter, almost new horizon. I asked about whips because of course, whips are more practical when you do planting projects. And they, because uh, uh, New Horizon is, is under license, they're not allowed to sell whips. Um, they've only done whips with one project to do with um, uh, uh, Chelsea Flower Show. Um, so yeah, they, and because they also want to microchip all their trees, obviously whips aren't big enough to uh, microchip. Um, so um, yeah, they had they had permission to um, sell sell whips to support the South Downs National Park, but the breeder has now withdrawn that agreement. So um, Howard, yeah, I'm going to have to butt in there, I'm afraid, because I just want to. I know there are people with questions, and I I, I think your work, if you're not already in touch with Andrew. Brooks, he's the great butterfly expert on elms. So perhaps you two could get in touch and see if, if Andrew could help you. I just want to get in one more speaker um, at this stage, which because we've had several mentions of David Hurling and, and the fantastic job that he was doing on elm research. We, we had uh, David came to uh, Brighton 
with a wonderful display of various elms he was working on. And, and now we've got Fergus, um, who just wants to, I think he's, Fergus is on the screen somewhere, but uh, let's see if we can ask him to take up the story of how he's keeping David's work going. Ah, Fergus is, is not here, perhaps. Well, that's, uh, that's a shame. Uh, but uh, do anyone else in touch with uh, David Hurling's work? So, Harry, you were talking about him. You, you, uh, I wonder if you're up to date on things. Uh, not on, on his uh, specific experiment. I mean, I, I, I uh, working with David, I put together a series of eight, um, I think there are eight plots of uh, a number of trees, some of whom are Juan Antonio's and some of whom um, are Alberto's, uh, but also other 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 varieties that are dotted around the country, um, including at Kew and at um, uh, and, and there's I think there's one at the Botanical Royal Botanic in in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I that, that that's all kind of ongoing. I don't think that I've got any update. I think Fergus would be much yeah. more interesting about um, the trees that. Um, he's, he's now, Fergus has now joined us again, so he can he can take. Thank you for stepping in there, Sir Harry. But uh, Fergus is here and got the up to date news for us. Oh, so sorry, to, I was called away urgently, but I've come back. Um, just to give a, a brief recap, in David Hurling's approach was um, to take the disease resistant hybrids, which were available, for example, from Alberto, um, and then back cross them with English elms, which had stood up against the disease in their natural setting. So he back crossed them against um, a, a stand of elms in Faversham which are fairly ravaged by disease, apart from a few trees, which were good examples of what he wanted in morphology, which was a figure of eight, you know, English elm landscape type tree. Um, so, so through various iterations of his crosses, um, in 2014-15, he successfully backcrossed um, the, the, the Faversham elm and produced approximately 120 offspring, all of which are genetically different which we then planted out in a, a trial in, in Watering Brew, which is just near Maidstone. Um, and of those trees, as soon as they were large enough, we challenged them with the, um, the latest pathogen through inoculation trials, which was cutting with a scalpel about a third way down and dripping in drops of the latest uh, pathogen that was available. And following the first year, um, a large proportion of the trees did show signs of disease, but half a dozen or so were entirely resistant. And three of those actually had the morphology, which, we, we, which David was looking for. Um, we then followed a second year of uh, challenging them in situ with the latest um, inoculation. Um, and of course we had trials with natural elms around and they died completely. So, so, so it was reasonably, resistant. Um, and uh, at that time, um, um, Richard Bugs kindly came along and he took genetic samples of not only the resistant trees, but also the trees that had succumbed. So because we knew the, the father and the, 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 the original trees, comparing those, the genetics with the offspring, that may have given some clue as to the genetic variability which gave rise to resistance and um, those which didn't because the trees that failed would, would, would give you useful information. In addition to that, um, the uh, Westmoreland Research Centre took cuttings from the top six trees and propagated those, uh, of which I think there were, were, were half, uh, 10 or so, um, which were brought up on, on other rootstock. And the hope was that those could be planted out and challenged to look at their field resistance, even though they were grafted onto rootstock uh, rather than straight from cuttings. Um, so we're now approaching the, the third year where next spring, I, I would like to 
re-inoculate the trees with the latest variant of the pathogen, if uh, I think uh, Clive could, could provide that to me. Um, I, but I will do all the trees again, because I have noticed that, um, but, uh, uh, as mentioned earlier in the meeting, these trees do bounce back and some trees have died entirely, but others have recovered. And it will be interesting to see how they respond to a second tranche of infection um, to, to, to look at that aspect as well. Because David was ultimately looking for field resistant trees, not total disease resistant trees, but field resistance so that they could be, that they would survive in, in, in the um, natural environment in the southeast, certainly. Um, so so, so that, that's where we are. Um, just a couple of household things is David's collection of trees that he had in his garden and were taken down to Lee's Court and Elizabeth's looking after those. For those people who agreed to take various trees, can they go and pick them up? Because if they don't, I'm just going to plant them out at Lee's Court anyway in, in settings just to see how they go. So they're his historic trial trees, which um, were there for distribution. Um, but this point about the, um, the cycle, looking at resistance, response and recovery, and adaptation in you know, a long-term transformation was pretty much David's call to arms in that he wanted trees that were genetically adapted but looked like English elms and were proven to be field resistant and then to propagate those, the, the best of those trees. So, so if, I, if I could share my screen, um, I just can show you roughly what the site looks like. Oh, I've got a thousand things open. Fergus, do you want us to um, give you a, a time to find something? And maybe someone's got a question to, uh, to keep us going in the meantime. Howard, you've got your hand up. Yes. Um, yeah, Almost Grabber horizontalis seems to grow very, very vigorously. Does it contribute to... Um, to to biodiversity, basically. It's quite a low, small tree. It, it survives really well. You see it in a lot of gardens and roadsides and riversides. Um, so uh, my question is about the cultivars of Glabra, uh, like horizontalis. Does it contribute much? And can it be, because I've always seen it to be very, very vigorous. So does it, could it be, you know, does it contribute much to the biodiversity? Anyone, well, anyone, can anyone answer that? Uh, sorry, Fergus, are you answering that? Uh, I, I, I would just say that, that where I live, there are plenty of elm, elm trees and hedgerows, which are absolutely fine and vigorous until they reach about 20 foot, and then they become infected and kill over and die. So, so, so the fact that a tree is small and vigorous, is it, 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 it's only once they reach a certain height that the natural vectors start knocking them down. So suckers yeah, come up. No. Yeah. But uh, almost grab a horizontalis uh, lives for a very long time um, and um, doesn't seem to be affected. I can show you, you know, I've seen two trees. Um, I, I keep monitoring one and it's just so vigorous. Unfortunately, of course, it's prostrate, it's horizontal, all those words. Um, and of course, it's not a tree. Um, it's, it's a very low horizontal grafted tree. Um, so you see sometimes in gardens and botanic gardens in different places, old Victorian varieties which are doing fine. And you uh, just wonder how they contribute to the um, biodiversity. Fergus, can you take that on? Well, um, the, the tr trees have their own e e micro environments 
So, so I'd say a tall tree has in different microenvironments through its height um, than the, the, the one that, that's, that's much lower. Um, but, but certainly David did plant out a couple of trees which he believed had natural resistance. As soon as we inoculated them with the latest strain, they killed over and died instantly. So, so, so just because a tree has been standing alone uh, and has not succumbed doesn't mean that it's actually resistant at all. It could just be its unique setting in that the, the vectors don't, don't get to it for one reason or another. Uh, but also from um, the, the white letter hair streak, um, I, I'm sure they're, they're not fussy about what elms they eat. Um, you just need the elm trees and the leaves and that's fine. So it, um, it, it's a difficult question to answer, but um, the, I, I, I think for the, the members of the public, the aesthetics of an elm tree to repair the damage which they has, has been caused, you know, the, 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 the debt, the society is owed to debt. I, I think the, 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 the Scots lady mentioned this point, it, it, it is a good motivation. So, 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 so the idea of having replacing what's been lost is something which is a debt owed to the future generations and replacing it in a smart way using, using genetics and understanding the disease processes um, it, it, it is the key. Um, I, I was very impressed by the, the, the Spanish, how quickly since 2015, they've been able to propagate trees and plant thousands of them, if only we could replicate that. Because whilst we're, we're having successes in finding disease resistant varieties that look fantastic, scaling up to thousands or tens of thousands of trees is, is, is what's really needed. Um, because it's only over 20, 30 years that you then see how they work in, in, in field conditions. Yeah, that was going to be the final part of my, my, my little talk, um, because the, uh, the, the concerns, the Epsom Common, they would love, they've got places to plant, they would like to plant, um, but how, how are they going to get funding for that planting? Yeah, well, there's a, a question for us all. And uh, Fergus, thank you very much for joining us uh, with that report. I know it's been a difficult time for you and it's difficult to talk about David's work. And it's just great that you've been able to take part today and to let everybody know that David's work is continuing and that it seems to be in very good hands with, with you. Yeah. For, so, so thank you very much for yes. taking part. Could, could, could I have another chance at sheen, screen sharing? I, I've got a... <laughs> Uh, I just, uh, there, can you see that at all? Not at the moment, no. Oh, I, okay. I need to press the screen share button, don't I? Yeah, okay. Yes, let's, I do. Uh, and since I press this, everything disappears. You succeeded before. Yeah, uh, I think Richard Bugs uh, put one up. Yeah. Uh, one of your pictures. Okay. Well, well anyway, I, I describe what the pictures would show. It, it shows an enclosed, because you see, I, I work for a water company. Um, they have enclosed sites, so they're not predated by deers. Where we've planted elm trees elsewhere, they're immediately attacked by deers as soon as they come uh, 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 out of their, their, their plastic guards. So uh, water sites are quite good because you have to keep members of the public out, and therefore they are untouched environments in, in good settings. Um, and so we're able to plant out trees in lines. So it's about half an acre with 150 trees in rows. Um, and there's no other disturbance to them, you know, which, which, is, a, which is a good set. The other point is um, this, this has been ongoing indefinitely. So whereas funding for trials might only have two or three years worth of research grant, um, at least this trial, you can look at the trees and follow them over decades if you need to. So it's a really good resource um, of, of, of an ongoing trial, which is, can provide valuable information, which is essential to, to the future structure going forward. So, so we're, we're actually six years into a very interesting and useful trial. And uh, uh, Karen's report does give more details of that if you want. Um, the other point is the three trees we selected are absolutely fantastic. They've, they've burst through their, their, um, their plastic shields. So they're out sort of six, seven inch diameter in the base. 
they're approximately 15, 20 foot tall, and they're ramrod straight, and they do have excellent morphology. So they're not weird looking trees. Um, they, go, they go straight up. But one of the things I have noticed where we've been planting other trees, uh, hybrids, um, is that they, they, they can split. You know, if they're too vigorous, they grow fantastically. And then either the wind knocks them straight over because they've got no stability, um, or, or, or the limbs start splitting off and the, the, the trees succumb just through physically not functioning well. So having a straight upright tree with good morphology it, it gives it a better chance of structurally being a stable tree as opposed to one that grows fantastically, but then just snaps in the, the first windstorm. So, so, so there, is, there are other factors in here other than disease, which, which I think are important and should be taken into account. Um, also, I'd say that we, we've planted disease resistant trees amongst them, including Varda, and with the uh, latest inoculants, even the Varda was knocked back a little bit. So, so in terms of how we've challenged these trees, we've actually given them a sort of do or die challenges along with known resistant varieties. So we've tried to be as you know, um, scientific as possible in, in showing that these aren't just flash in the pans, they're actually quite exciting trees. Fergus, uh, we, we've had a question just asking, can people read about your work or is it is it on a website or something? How can people find out what, more about what you're doing? Um, well, 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 there is Karen's uh, report which does go into the, the watering retrial. Um, but certainly I, I, I think um, it's, it's a, David's own website is overdue an update showing, because I've got picture records um, of the trees, how they're doing, the, the philosophy taken, and that ought to be published because um, David um, was always wanting to share the information and the the hybrids and distribute them at cost or for free. That there, there, there's, you know, no issues regarding, you, you, you know, a commercial activity. It was purely altruistic because we and I were around in the 70s when we were, all these trees, trees were being chain, chainsawed down. But I think to um, propagate the trees, we'll need investment either from government or private resources. Now that we think we've got some winners here you know, UK bred uh, and reasonably rigorously um, tested. So okay, well, Fergus, thank you very much for that. Richard Bugs has put into the chat box a, a website that uh, people might like to make a note of. And it's on my screen, I, it's sitting next to you is David Alderman, who uh, runs the tree register for, uh, that you will all know about. Uh, David sent me an email not long ago, a, a bit depressed about the state of elms that he gets on his register. Um, David, have you been encouraged by what you've heard today? I hope so. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I have, David. I mean, I, I can um, sort of uh, uh, reiterate what other people have have said about um, uh, how volunteers have been out there and have seen more disease um, in the last sort of 12 months than perhaps they've seen for some time. Uh, in answer to Howard's question about um, horizontalis, um, the biggest, oldest specimens of um, horizontalis are very susceptible to elm disease. And a lot of them in Scotland um, are dying at the moment, particularly those in the churchyards um, right from Aberdeen, Dundee, um, all, all over now, in, in Edinburgh as well. So disease is rife, but I think many of them have missed probably the beetle because they're quite low and flat. So they've, that's why they've survived. But um, where disease is rife and they're quite big, um, <laughs> in, in, albeit flat and quite low, um, they are clearly very susceptible. So uh, that perhaps answers that one. On a plus point though, uh, because volunteers have been out um, perhaps looking more locally, um, we've actually discovered uh, some fantastic surviving elm trees, which we never knew about, including champion field elm. Uh, and we're talking trees of five and a half meters in, uh, in, uh, in, in Suffolk, which is an area where we think people have been recording for many years 
uh, in great detail. I can understand if Colin comes up with a five meter tree down in Cornwall and think, well, that's fantastic. You know, Colin, get out there and find some more. <laughs> but in <laughs> Suffolk, in Suffolk, where people, um, you know, have recorded historically many big trees to still come across surviving big elm trees, that is really encouraging. So, um, yeah, some good news as well as, as bad news has been coming through from, from the volunteers. Great. Well, thank you, David. And thank you, everybody, for taking part. I hope you found this session worthwhile. And you do think there's still a future for elms after all that. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Toby for pressing all the buttons and making this a trouble-free uh, broadcast. Um, we've got so many people taking part and so many people wanted to give presentations. I'm sorry if anyone didn't get called upon, but hopefully we'll have another round table. And if not, we'll perhaps help Sir Harry with his conference, but it's great to have everybody involved. And aren't we lucky to have Zoom? You know, this would have been uh, impossible or a very expensive task to bring people as they have Germany, Italy, Spain, Scotland. There's bound to be somebody I'd forgotten, but uh, I managed to fall off my stool. I don't know if that was excitement or I knocked over my tree. But anyway, the tree is here and hopefully you'll see it come the spring in with its new leaves on it. So unless anyone's got a burning issue, Richard, you, David, you are responsible for this. David, are you, David, sorry, there's someone trying to say. Sorry. David, John from the Tea Council here. Yeah. Um, just in that last question bit before we close, yeah. I came into the meeting I came into the meeting reasonably confident I knew what I was talking about. I come out of the meeting less confident that I know what I'm talking about because my original question of how many species there are, in Richard's paper there are two. Um, then Juan was talking about Prosera, which was three, and John Tucker sent me a fabulous paper where there are 60 species of elm in Britain. So I would really at some point like to come back at being able to articulate as a as an industry, how many elms, native elms there are in Britain? Because I want to know whether English elm is a species or a subspecies and where we all agree. So maybe for another meeting, for another conversation, we can come back at this. Because as I say, I came into the meeting feeling vaguely confident I've come out the other end. <laughs> Much less happy than I was coming into it. No, you can't please everybody, can you? Anyway, John, no, you can. David, that's the whole point. The whole the whole point is, is this, and it's exactly the same with a whole number of species. As that is that um, you know, and, and when we get onto native species, you can you can kind of split and subdivide and say you've got a subspecies here or or not. You know, I noticed the other day, you know, we saw 80 you took, you know, there was a the IUCN had about 80 different sorts of species. John, it's up to your audience how many species of elm there are. You can choose three or 60, depending on who you're talking to. Yeah, and as long as, as long as we're all comfortable in that space, Harry, I'm quite comfortable with that. But it's just if, you, it's just if we all end up in different, different places that it gets slightly awkward. <laughs> well, that's a challenge for next year's tree week, John. Find out just how yes. many these damn trees there are. But anyway, the main there's still some around, and we're still finding them. <laughs> so uh, thanks for everybody for taking part. Uh, and as I say, thanks to Toby for pressing the buttons and for all of you staying on till we're just, well, we've overspent our time. So it just shows how much we were enjoying it. So goodbye and see you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>